ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله all praises due to allah we praise him and seek his assistance we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within ourselves and from the evil of our deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides, none can misguide him. Yet whomever he allows to go astray, none can guide him. And I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah alone. He has no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. O you who believe, fear Allah as he should be feared, and do not die except in the state of Islam. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu attaqu Allah wa qulu qawlan sadeeda, yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum, wa may yuta'i Allah wa rasoolahu faqad faza fawzan azeema. O you who believe, fear Allah and speak the truth. He will direct you to do righteous good deeds and will forgive your sins. And whomsoever obeys Allah and His Messenger, he has indeed achieved a great achievement. Amma ba'd. Fa inna astaqa al-hadithi kitabullah wa ahsan al-hadi hadi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharra al-umuri muhdathatuha wa kulla muhdathatin bid'a wa kulla bid'atin dhalala wa kulla dhalalatin fi al-nar. Brothers in Islam, the topic of our khutbah today is one of great and vital importance. It is an extremely important topic in Islam and an important part of the religion and an integral part of who the believing man or woman is. But unfortunately, this topic that we're going to talk about, it's regarded as being from fada'il al-a'mal, from the extra good deeds or something that you do once you complete your act of worship. But the truth is, it's not something that you do and you add on on top of your acts of worship. It is an integral part of who you are. The topic of our khutbah today is good akhlaq, good manners, good behavior. It's an integral part of who the believing man or woman is. And it is not something that you add on as extra credit once you complete the acts of worship and once you finish the other aspects of the religion, then you add on good akhlaq for good measure. No, it is one of the most important parts of the religion. One of the most important things in Islam, your good manners, as we're going to look at that, inshallah. The first thing we see that when Allah Azza wa Jal mentions why he sent the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is a mention or an, an indication to the importance of akhlaq. Allah Azza wa Jal says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we have not sent you except as a mercy to mankind or to the universe. So Allah Azza wa Jal is telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that your sending is a mercy to the universe. So, we can all understand how the sending of the Prophet ﷺ is a mercy because it is through the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ that someone will enter into paradise and avoid eternity into the hellfire because he is the one who taught us the Tawheed, who taught us how to pray to Allah Azza wa Jal. So we can clearly see how in the Akhirah, in the next life, the sending of the Prophet ﷺ is a clear mercy. But no doubt, he was sent as a mercy in this life and in the next as well. And part of mercy in this life includes having good akhlaq. If someone were to tell you that there is a village, and in this village there is every aspect of bad akhlaq. There is this village and everyone in this village hates the other person. People lie about each other. They spread rumors about one another. There is a lot of backbiting. There is a lot of envy, jealousy and hatred. Could you describe that there is a lot of mercy in this village? For sure you can't, because you cannot have mercy without having good akhlaq. You cannot have mercy without having the rules of how to deal with one another. 
the rules of kindness and speaking the truth and being gentle with one another and not lying and not backbiting. So that means in order for there to be mercy in this dunya, there has to be good akhlaq. And that means when Allah Azawajal tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ and we have not sent you except as a mercy to the universe. In this ayah, there is an indication to good akhlaq and to the importance of good akhlaq. Not only that, when we see the Prophet ﷺ himself speaking about why he was sent, he also mentions akhlaq. It's as if he was just sent for the sake of akhlaq. So the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ Verily, I was sent to complete or to perfect the, the most noble of good character. So the Prophet ﷺ is telling why he was sent. And he could easily have said, I was sent to establish Tawheed. I was sent so people would say, La ilaha illallah. I was sent so people would pray. I was sent so people would go to jihad. Or so people would go to hajj. Or so people would fast in Ramadan. All these are important things. But the Prophet ﷺ says, I was sent to perfect the most noble of good character. It's as if he was only sent to improve people's manners, to improve people's akhlaq. So we begin to see how important the topic of akhlaq actually is in Islam. Not only that, but we also find that the acts of worship, the acts of worship of salah and zakah and hajj and fasting, part of their aim is to impact your akhlaq. Part of the goals also of the acts of worship are to affect your manners and to affect your akhlaq. That's why we find Allah Azawajal says about the salah, إِنَّ الصَّلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَلَى الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ Verily the, the salah prevents the wicked deeds and the reprehensible acts. So we see the act of worship, salah, and we see the effect it's supposed to have on your akhlaq. When it comes to hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَا رَفَثَ وَلَا فُسُوقَ وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجِّ When it comes to hajj, there is, no, there is no sexual activity between a man and his wife, but there is also no vain talk and no argumentation in hajj. So we see the act of worship, hajj, and we see the effect it's supposed to have on your akhlaq. Likewise, when we look at other acts of worship such as fasting, we see a clear link between fasting and akhlaq. It is so unfortunate that the majority of people, they only define fasting as not eating and not drinking from sunup to sundown. So many people are very concerned about what goes inside their mouth during Ramadan, but they don't care what comes out. So these people are very cautious and very careful. When they make wudu, they spit a hundred times to make sure not a droplet of water goes into their mouth, but they don't care what comes out. And while they're fasting during the day in Ramadan, they're saying the most horrible things. Well, one of the, the impact of fasting on your akhlaq is that you guard your tongue. And that's why you find when someone insults you while you're fasting, you're supposed to respond by saying, Inni sa'im, inni sa'im. I'm fasting, I'm fasting. So even in fasting, it has an effect on your akhlaq. It's supposed to impact your manners. So we see a lot of people, their focus would be on certain acts of worship and not really on having good akhlaq and good manners and good behavior with their fellow human being. Well, the truth is, even the acts of worship were there to have some impact and to improve your manners. And the problem is, brothers and sisters in Islam, that when someone does not work on their manners, and if they were focusing on their knowledge, and it comes packaged with bad manners, no one will accept that knowledge from them. No one will accept that knowledge. And you have probably all encountered someone who was fairly knowledgeable in your community or in your masjid, but very bad in manners. And most people don't like to deal with that individual, even though they know what Allah says and what His Messenger وسلم, says. But whenever they present it to you, it's packaged in bad akhlaq. And because it's packaged in bad akhlaq, you don't accept it from them. Allah Azza wa Jal, tells us in the Qur'an that the best of people, the best of hearts, the hearts of the Sahaba, would have refused the best message ever sent to humanity, the Qur'an, if it was packaged in bad akhlaq. Allah Azza wa Jal 
tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيذَ الْقَلْبِ لَمْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكَ And if you were crude and hard-hearted, they would have scattered from around you. So Allah Azza wa is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though you're bringing them the best message, the Qur'an, and the hearts of the Sahaba, the best hearts, they would have refused this best message if it came packaged with bad akhlaq. They would not have accepted it. And so we see the importance and the impact of akhlaq on how you deal with people, on everything, on your da'wah, on whether or not people accept advice from you, on whether or not people want to engage with you in any kind of dealing in this life. It all depends on your akhlaq. Especially for the da'iyah, it is so important. And that's why you find, for example, Imam Malik, rahimahullah, when his mother sent him to study with the scholar of Medina, Rabi'at al-Ra'i, she sent him as a young boy to study and she gives him excellent advice. She tells him, اذهب إلى ربيعة فتعلم من أدبه قبل علمه. She said, go to Rabi'at al-Ra'i and learn from his manners before you learn from his knowledge. Learn from his manners first. Because if you have knowledge, with bad manners, no one will accept it from you. No one will want to sit around you to take that knowledge and no one will want to deal with you. So she said, learn from his manners before you learn from his knowledge. And a lot of times we see young men who put a lot of time into learning the knowledge, but they have bad manners. And so no one accepts from them and no one wants to deal with them. The importance of good manners, brothers and sisters. So then we see if this advice of the mother of Imam Malik rahimahullah, if this advice worked or not. Later on, one of his students, a brilliant student, stayed with him for 20 years. He said, with, within the first year, I gathered all of the knowledge of the Imam. In one year, he learned all of the, the knowledge of the Imam and all the hadith. For 19 years, it was repetition to him. Every time he heard a hadith, he heard it before. So they asked him, if you gathered the knowledge of the Imam in the first year, why did you remain for 19 other years with the Imam? And he said, I remained with the Imam for 19 other years just to learn from his manners. Just to see how he dealt with his neighbor, how he dealt with a fellow scholar, how he dealt with his students, how he dealt with a man, how he dealt with a woman, how he dealt with an ignorant person, how he dealt with a child. So you see him being an ocean of knowledge himself in his dealings with people. That someone would stay for 19 years just to learn from his manners. But not only that, then he says something more profound. He says, and I wish all of the 20 years was just to learn from his manners. I wish I spent that first year as well learning from the manners of the Imam. And then when you look at many ahadith, they show you the importance of good manners and how important it is for the believing man or woman to have excellent manners. So many people focus on certain aspects of the religion or they focus on certain acts of worship and they neglect their good manners. They focus a lot on salah. They even focus on a lot on the external appearance which has its importance in Islam and there is nothing in Islam that is not important. Everything the Prophet ﷺ taught us is important and this is a huge mistake that some people make when they try to break the sunnah into important and to peripheral issues. No. Everything the Prophet ﷺ taught is an important issue. But we see that with the importance of good manners, we see many hadith when they speak about a great reward, it's linked to good manners. And good manners is linked to your iman as well. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَصْمُتْ Whoever believes in Allah in the last day, he should say that which is good or remain quiet. If you don't have anything good to say, just remain quiet. But this, this act of manners, the Prophet ﷺ linked it to belief in Allah Azza wa Jal. So your good manners linked to your iman as well. And people, like I said, focus a lot on external appearances, even though they're important. But the point is, Islam never focused just on your exterior. Islam never just focused on your appearance without giving as much, if not far more attention 
to internally, to what happens internally. And that's why we find even the dua of looking in the mirror. When you look in the mirror, you're mostly focused about your external appearance. No one looks in the mirror to see what's in their heart. They look in the mirror to see their physical appearance. The dua of looking in the mirror, while you're looking at your exterior appearance, reminds you of your interior. So in the dua of looking in the mirror, the believing man or woman, they say, Allahumma ahsin khulqi kama ahsanta khalqi. Or, they, or in another narration, Allahumma hassin khulqi kama hassanta khalqi. Oh Allah, improve or, or improve or complete my manners as you have improved my external appearance, my creation, my khalq, my physical appearance. Even when you're looking at yourself physically, the dua reminds you to look internally because of the importance of good manners. One day the Prophet ﷺ asked his companions, Atadruna man al muflis? Do you know who is the one who is bankrupt? So they said, Ya Rasulullah, al muflis fina man la dirham lahu wa la mata'. They said, O Prophet of Allah, the one who is bankrupt is the one who has no dirham, no currency, and he has no possessions. So then the Prophet ﷺ explained to them that the one who is bankrupt is the one who comes forth on the Day of Judgment with a lot of good deeds. He comes forth with a lot of fasting and a lot of hajj and a lot of zakah. So he comes forth with a mountain of good deeds. But he also came forth with bad manners. And he has insulted this person and he has hit that person and he may have lied against that person or killed that person, so they will take from his good deeds. They will take from his good deeds. Beware of this, brothers and sisters in Islam. Because when you commit an offense against Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might forgive you. But if you commit an offense against a human being, make sure you get forgiveness from them in this world. You make it up to them in this world, or they will take it from your most valuable possession. They will take it from your good deeds. So the Prophet ﷺ describes this man who came on the Day of Judgment with a mountain of good deeds. He insulted people, so he starts to give them from his good deeds. And then when he has no more good deeds, when his good deeds expire, there's still a list of people that he has offended in this dunya. So he will start to take from their bad deeds until the Prophet ﷺ described he will be thrown into the hellfire. But let's contemplate this hadith. Where does this take place? Where does it take place? Where does this tasfiyah and the, the settling of accounts between the Muslims, where does it take place? It takes place in front of the gates of paradise. In front of the gates of paradise. So let's contemplate how many stages and how many tests this man made and passed until he got in front of the gates of paradise. First, there is the difficulty of death itself. And on those, for those who have good deeds, it's not that difficult. So he made it past the difficulty of the soul leaving the body. And then he made it past the difficulty of the questioning, the three questions in the grave. And he made it past the torment and the punishment in the grave. This person also made it past the difficulty of the day of resurrection itself. Where Allah Azza wa Jal brings back to life every human being that ever lived. And he sets them and lets them stand on one plain and level earth. And the sun is one mile away from people's heads. And people will stand there naked, not talking, no joking, no side conversations, no smiling. For 50,000 years, people will stand like that. But for those of, who do good deeds, it will seem like a short day. So he made it past that stage as well. Then he made it past being called in front of Allah Azza wa Jal as everyone will come and stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and will be asked about everything they did in this world. He made it past that stage as well. And he made it past the Sirat, the bridge that's 500 years over the hellfire, sharper than a sword, thinner than a hair, and craftier than a fox. He crossed over the Sirat while some people crawl and some people fall and don't make it up again. But he made it and he passed and he got in front of the gates of paradise then the believers will be called again one by one. Whoever has anything, anything to settle with this person, come and take it from him. 
So can you imagine that he made it past all these difficult stages and he's right there in front of the gates of paradise and then he's thrown back into the hellfire after all this. Thrown back into the hellfire even though he had a mountain of good deeds in the beginning but he was thrown back because of his bad manners. Because of his poor akhlaq. And so now we begin to see how in Islam, akhlaq is a very important part. It's an integral part of who you are. And it's not just something that you add on, on top in the end. That's why one of the early Muslims, Yahya ibn Mu'adh, rahimahullah, he used to say that good deeds do not compensate for bad manners, while good manners may compensate for bad deeds. Good deeds do not compensate for bad manners. Your good deeds will not make up for your bad manners. Just like we saw in the hadith. The man came forth with a lot of good deeds, but he came forth with bad manners, and his bad manners ate away, took away all of his good deeds. That's why good deeds do, are not enough. They don't make up for your bad manners. And then he says, well, your good manners, possibly they can make up for your bad deeds. How do we know that? We know it from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he describes that nothing on the scale of the believer on the Day of Judgment is heavier than good manners. So when your good deeds are physically weighed on the Day of Judgment, the heaviest thing you would expect it to be your salah, you would expect it to be your zakah, your hajj, your umrah. But the heaviest thing on your scale on the Day of Judgment is your good manners. And that's why if you have a lot of good manners, it possibly could make up for your bad deeds. So we begin to see then the importance of good akhlaq, that it's not just something extra that you add on once you completed the salawat and once you completed other aspects of the religion, but it's an integral and very important part of who you are and how you deal with people. And so many times you look at something that's great and reward, it goes back to having good manners. The Prophet ﷺ said, the best amongst you, خيركم, خيركم لأهله, وأنا خيركم لأهله. The best amongst you are the best of you to their family. And then he says, and I'm the best amongst you to their family. So we see again the best and it's related to akhlaq. The most beloved people to Allah, those of good akhlaq. Those closest to the Prophet ﷺ on the day of judgment, the best of you in akhlaq. So many times when you see the best or great reward, you go back to the hadith and it has something to do with akhlaq. It has something to do with good manners. And so with that, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who are excellent in their manners and in their dealings with their fellow Muslims and with humanity in general. أقول قول هذا وأستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم من جميع الذنوب فاستغفروه فيا فوز المستغفرين Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness. Surely those who ask for his forgiveness shall prosper. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. So now we begin to see how important this topic is. But it is so unfortunate that many times we attend khutab or we learn something that is important and then our practice falls short. Our practice falls short. We all know that we're to have good manners with men and women. We're supposed to have good manners with the believing uh, men and women, with Muslim and also the non-Muslim as well. And we especially يعني, those of us who, who live in countries where there are a lot of laws against physically injuring people or physically touching people. People will follow those laws. They will not inflict any physical injury on someone. In certain countries, if you touch someone with the tip of your finger, it's considered physical assault. And so you'll find Muslims in those places, they will never touch anyone, but they will say the worst things about people. The worst thing is they will say, because the law permits it. But they won't touch because the law doesn't permit it. But this is not how a believer behaves. And sometimes you find that in an Islamic court, the offense of the tongue is far more severe than the offense of the hand. If we have someone who slapped another or he, who hit another person, if he takes him to court, the judge might make him pay a fine or he might ask the other person, to hit him back in the same way of equal measure, not harder and not softer. 
But if someone comes to court and he has accused a good believing woman of doing something immoral, here he might be whipped and he doesn't have enough witnesses, he, he will be lashed 80 times. He will be lashed 80 times because of something that he said with his tongue. We see here the judgment being far more severe than, an, than uh, on something that is physical. But it was more severe on something that was said with the tongue. Sometimes the tongue can be far more damaging than what is physical. But so many times people, they don't have any regard for what happens and what is said by the tongue. And they care much more so if someone is hit or he's physically pushed or something of that sort. But because now we understand the importance of this topic, we're going to care more about what comes out of our tongue, insha'Allah. But the problem is so many times people hear things in khutab and they hear things in tapes and CDs and lectures and they read books and they read articles, but nothing happens. But nothing happens after that. So make sure that when you come and you attend any khutbah and you attend any class, that one of your goals and your intentions while going to that event is that you will learn something so you can come back and up start applying it immediately. So you can learn it in order to apply it. And this is how the companions of the Prophet ﷺ were. They learned so they can apply. They did not learn just so they can gather and accumulate information and have the hadith ready so they can argue with other people about it. That's all people do now. They just learn this information and they argue. They sit at dinner, they argue about religion. At breakfast, they argue about religion. They meet people in the street, they argue with them about religion. And that's not our job, just to argue constantly, to gather information just so we can argue, to gather information so you can act upon it. Abu Bakr came to the Prophet ﷺ. He tells him, "Alimni du'aan, du'aan, ad'u bihi fi salati. And in another narration, "Alimni du'aan, ad'u bihi fi salati wa fi bayti. Teach me a dua that I can use in my salah or that I can use in my salah and in my home. So he came to learn so he could go apply. So today we learned about the importance of good akhlaq. And so many things the Prophet ﷺ has linked to your iman as we said that are actually part of good akhlaq. Even smiling. Even smiling in the face of your brother is a charity. But how many of us now, test yourself, how many of us smile at the face of everybody? How many of us always smile at people? And even those who are in some people's sight are doing other jobs, those who open doors for you, how many people smile at them? How many people ask them about their personal affairs and if everything is okay? But it is unfortunate that just within the, the one day that we've been in this country, we noticed that certain people, when you give them salam, they're surprised that you give them salam. The people who clean the floors, the people who clean the bathrooms, when you give them salam and you smile at them, they're surprised that you give them salam. They're surprised that you smile at them. Why? Because they're not used to it. Nobody smiles at them, even though we claim to follow the Prophet ﷺ, who used to make everybody feel important. Even children, the Prophet ﷺ would make them feel important. But how many children now in the masjid, when you give salam and you shake hands with their father, the child won't extend his arm out because he's used to people ignoring him. The Prophet ﷺ made everybody feel important. Part of the proof of that, during the battle of Badr, on the way to Badr, the Prophet ﷺ stopped the army and also on the way to Uhud. They stopped the army and they took all the young people out of the army. So the question is, what were the young people doing there to begin with? The young people were there because they felt they were worthy. Because at that time, everybody felt they were worthy. And young people felt they were worthy. But we don't do that today. Even though, for sure, everyone in this room is aware of that, that the Prophet ﷺ used to behave in a certain way with people, used to smile, was always kind. But yet, we always fall short when it comes to application. And that's why it's so important for us now to renew and refresh our niya, our intention, this instant. That we're going to start to apply to the best of our, of our ability what we learned in any khutbah and what we learn in any speech. And one of, the, one of the things about akhlaq is that part of it is hereditary. You acquire certain traits from your parents. And the other part is muktasab, that you can 
you acquire it by yourself. Because if you could not acquire it, Allah wouldn't ask it from you. So you can improve on your manners. That's why one of the, one of the Bedouin Arabs, one of the Muslims, he came to the Prophet Sallallahu and then he says that I have this, this crudeness, this harshness of the Bedouin, so give me advice. That's what he wanted from the Prophet Sallallahu He wanted advice so he can fix himself. So you get advice from your brothers and your sisters about your akhlaq so you can fix yourself. Because every single one of us wants to improve. So the Prophet ﷺ only tells this man three words and he changed his behavior until his death. For the rest of his life he changed from three words. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, فَلَا تَسُبَّنَّ أَحَدًا Do not curse anyone. And he says immediately, فَمَا سَبَبْتُ أَحَدًا وَلَا شَاتًا وَلَا بَعِيرًا from that day, I never cursed anyone, but not only that, he added to it. He never cursed any human being, but he added animals as well. Not even a sheep, not even a camel. Even that. And he stopped cursing immediately. And he didn't stop gradually, as people do now. And he didn't go back to it. He didn't stop for two weeks and then go back to it. But why was it that three words changed this man immediately and changed his akhlaq and changed his behavior? Just three words? Because he was sincere in wanting to change. He was sincere when he came to the Prophet ﷺ to ask about something. He came to ask because he wanted to change. So many people now, they ask you about something and they don't want to change. So why are you asking? Why are you asking? So many people will ask you, is what I'm wearing haram? You tell them, yes, thank you. And they don't take it off. So many people ask you, is this permissible? You tell them, no. And they keep doing it. So why did you ask? Aisha radiallahu anha, a young boy used to come to her and she would teach him hadith. She taught him two hadith on the first day. And then he came back the next day. So she asked him, did you memorize, did you act upon the two hadith that I taught you yesterday? Did you act upon it? Did you do it? And he said, no. She said, then why are you increasing the arguments of Allah against you? Because every time you know this is the ruling in Islam and you know this is something you're supposed to do. You memorize the hadith. You don't do it. Allah has an argument against you. You memorized it. Perhaps the person who never heard it might have an excuse. But what excuse do you have? So Aisha was teaching him. Why are you increasing the arguments of Allah against you? So why would you just gather knowledge, attend lectures, attend khutab and listen to lectures just for the sake of gathering information? and not for the sake of applying it. So inshallah we all renew and refresh our intentions right now that whenever we attend any lecture or listen to any lecture, we do that with the intention of wanting to learn something so we can go home and apply it. And we all now advise one another and accept advice when someone tells us about a certain act or mannerism, certain act of behavior, because we don't want to offend people in this dunya. Because when you offend people in this dunya, they take it from your most valuable belongings. They take it from your good manners. And that's why Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahullah, one time he was told about certain people that were saying bad things about him. They were saying bad things about him. So he sent them a bowl of dates, a gift. A bowl of dates with a note that said, I heard that you have assigned to me, you have given me some of your good deeds because they were speaking bad about him, he'll take it back from their good deeds. He said, I have heard that you have given me some of your good deeds. I could not find anything to thank you with besides these dates. So please accept them from me. So try that the next time someone says something bad. Instead of going and fighting and so forth, send them a gift and say thank you for giving me some of your good deeds. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to improve our akhlaq. And I, I'm, I'm told to remind you that there is a, there is a lecture here at Al-Fanar uh, tomorrow, which is Saturday, and there will be flyers distributed uh, around the, the, the place. So uh, make sure you get a, a flyer, make sure you, you come and bring a friend and attend with the intention of learning something that you, 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 can, you can apply. So with that, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who hear the speech and follow the best of it. Allahumma <laughs> arana al-haqqa haqqan wa arzuqna attiba'ah wa arana al-baatila baatilan wa arzuqna ijtinaabah O Allah, show us the truth as clear truth and assist us in following it and show us the falsehood as very clear falsehood and assist us in abstaining from it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give victory to Islam 
We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give victory to the Muslims who are being dealt with unjustly around the world and to grant the freedom to all the Muslims who are being held unjustly worldwide. And we ask him to send his salah and salam upon his final messenger Muhammad and upon his family and those who follow them upon righteousness until the day of resurrection. فَاللَّهُمَّ أَبْرِمْ لَهَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ أَمْرَ رُشْدٍ يُعَزُّ فِيهِ أَهْلُ طَاعَتِكَ وَيُذَلُّ فِيهِ أَهْلُ مَعْصِيَتِكَ وَيُؤْمَرْ فِيهِ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيُنْهَى فِيهِ عَلَى الْمُنْكَرِ يَا سَمِيعَ الدُّعَاءِ وَصَلَى اللَّهُمَّ وَبَارَكَ عَلَى مُبْرِثِ رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ وَقُمُوا ل